1970 200 SL 280 or I should say 280 SL pretty good condition paint is in excellent condition interior is in very good condition I wouldn't say excellent but it's in very good condition it has those old tweed mats 96,000 miles on it dash is in good condition so we have the hang on units if you guys remember the old Fords and old American cars where you would have the hang on um, god dang what was the name of those Vin uh, not vintage air vintage air copied them later on uh, Mark IVs uh, back in the late 60s 70s my dad used to install them on cars. He had a shop where we'd get in uh, the old Mark IVs and put them in all the police cars in Army and military and aftermarket installs. When they'd come off the train from storage from Detroit and they'd go directly to a shop to be installed. And uh, the German cars would come in off the pier from the ships and go to a store and they would install systems like this. And so you could see the model. So 9 of 1970, 280 SL. Hmm. Very nice. A little more. So this air conditioning system, when you first look at it, because their systems are not like this anymore on these and for the young guys coming into play there's something a little different that should be put back on some of the systems now that nowadays what would help but what they did was they put it, uh, internal expansion uh, internal heat exchangers to increase efficiency and this where they have a sub cooling condenser so this has two condensers on it you have the primary condenser Let's see if I can focus in the dark here. Okay, there we go. So you have the primary condenser. This had the old 7 8 inch tubes that you could see there, really big tubes. These tubes you were able to flush out if you had a burnt up compressor. Occasionally, a tube would get plugged so bad you couldn't uh, flush it out. But if it was a mild burnout, this kind of condenser in the old days, back in the 60s and in the early 70s, we used to flush these out. So this one right here, this is the liquid line coming up right here, going towards the receiver dryer. Now that comes from the condenser that's located inside the bumper right here. So this is a single row so you only see one tube. You don't see one tube and then another tube in front of it. Like you'd see some condensers would have two rows of 3 8 tubes. This has one single row serpentine. So that means the refrigerant path only takes one circuit, one line, and it's like a snake. That's why it's serpentine. And the refrigerant just keeps going in this continuous loop back and forth on one row of tubes. It comes down. Now I gotta get under. And you can see the tubes under here a little bit, or the fins. And we get under the bumper here. And you can see this is pretty long. It goes all the way from one bumper stop here, all the way to the farthest bumper stop over here. So out of the bottom of the condenser, right here, here's your last row of tubes. It comes down out of the bottom of the condenser. Then from here, it goes into what would be called the kind of sub condenser, sub cooling condenser. And you would have hopefully nearly a, a liquid by the time you get here. But since this was such a poor job of a single row, single pass condenser, it's still just cooled vapor. Then you'd see it go from here and it'd go into a common header one big long header not a single row going into one doing serpentine again this one I would actually do like oh 
what would this one do? This would do uh, three, one, two, three, three passes. So this goes into a single row header right here. And then there's three tubes, one, two, three. These three tubes would go continuously all the way to the back and then they make a turn and they go up and they come back down the middle of the row coming back this way and if you can see i'm trying to see my finger up here really hard to focus sorry about that it would be nice if i turned on my light but you could see up inside here that it comes back in the middle and then it goes up to the top row and then from the top row it makes a travel with three three tubes and the three tubes go all the way back again and then they come back again and they come in the top row they make a turn they go up and they come back all the way again and then up at the very top there there's another header that unfortunately I cannot focus on or get way back up there and they come to another header just like this lower header and they come in back up there and here supposedly they are supposed to be nearly all liquid and sub cold if you took the temperature you would see the temperature difference if you took the temperature from where the refrigerant line enters the top of the condenser and the refrigerant line comes out right here you would have a certain temperature drop and then if you took the temperature where the refrigerant enters the subcooling condenser and then comes back down out again you would see another temperature drop from there um, unfortunately it's it's pretty poor airflow down here because there's literally almost no way for air to go in and out normally you would have a license plate right here that would you know what little to no venting here there's no venting up here there's nowhere for venting to come out so it's not the greatest job on uh, sub cooling then the circuit path comes right here from what we've seen that, that was the pipe going out it falls now these hoses have been replaced and this hose follows and it'll go all the way to the receiver and here we go going to the receiver right here goes into receiver and out of receiver and I don't know why my uh, camera does not want to focus today but if we look at the sight glass right here this was retrofitted over in 2000 so somebody did this before and there's the old retrofit sticker from many years ago back in the year 2000 and there's the the date right there if you could see it and if you look on the inside surface let's see if I could zoom in okay the dirtiness is not on the outside of the glass the dirtiness you see is on the inside of the glass and a little imperfection in the center of the glass that is not clear it's a little cloudy and dirty that is from contamination that you know has a little acid content moisture rust corrosion on the inside and that was from poor practices and even when they installed the systems they were never really installed right in the first place they never put them on a long enough vacuum even though they were brand new components to keep them clean then it got serviced inside a shop who knows how long it was open to the atmosphere didn't change the receiver dryer at probably at the time they did these hoses they didn't think about service because they put the service fitting right below the coolant con reservoir container isn't that nice I mean you, you can't even get to it barely thank god it's flexible I'm gonna have to really push down on this and get my my line down there onto that so somebody when they did this hose you always can tell when somebody doesn't have experience and they don't think about their job they just slap stuff anywhere they don't think about servicing this 
if this was the location you were going to choose you should have at least put this at like at a 45 degree angle coming out here so you could connect on your connector but that was a non thought out procedure same goes for the high side if you see where i had to do the high side way down here let me again look at where they put the high side right off the fitting off the compressor that's a no-go it would have been really nice if they would have put the high side somewhere out here i mean you have all the space all the way from here all this free space somewhere along the line you could put a, a high side fitting and if you were going to do some updates and modifications there was uh, you can choose your own part numbers and you can choose a receiver dryer mostly on the truck lines you can have a high side fitting that's built right onto the receiver dryer they even have receiver dryers they're not used in automotive but in truck lines because trucks are important but the guys working on them are not uh, so they don't think of it they actually have receiver dryers with moisture indicators built into them and you will know when somebody has contaminated your system with moisture or they recharge from a recycling unit that they never serviced and changed the filters and they have wet refrigerant they're pumping back into your system or they left the system open while they were working on it and they reused the receiver dryer which they should never do and you'll see the moisture indicator will turn from green to yellow uh, of course in automotive field they don't want you to know that a shop did something wrong and it costs an extra 25 cents to put that on a receiver dryer so 25 cents for manufacturing cost would mean ten dollars markup by the time it got to the end customer or more so there's like a ten thousand percent markup from it gets from the manufacturer through several lines of distributing to a warehouse holding to distribute it into the states then from the states to the parts house from the parts house to the mechanic then from the mechanic to the end customer there's so many places mark out so they leave stuff like that out when i used to do these old systems and put them in i would find receiver dryers that had the same desiccant proper desiccant and chamber size of capacity and i would order the ones that had uh, moisture indicators on them and because there were jobs i was doing and I always told the customer, I instructed, I'd show the customer one lane on my bench where it turns yellow. And I'd show them, I go, if I don't service your system and you go somewhere else, you will see before you take a look at it, take a picture. And while well, this is back before pictures days, the later guys, I actually put inline moisture indicators in my lines. When I make up lines or I make up hoses, I put inline sight glasses with moisture indicators on them. If I were to service this vehicle, somewhere in line here, I would mount a solid sight glass with a moisture indicator on it and instruct my customer. I go, you see this is green? This will stay green. When you go somewhere and they service it with an R&R &R machine, uh, recycle, recovery, uh, recharge machine, usually they'll have contaminated refrigerant and it'll have a high moisture content that desiccant material that would be in the sight glass would turn from green to yellow immediately after even after they charged it up and that means they just contaminated your system at that point you stop you insist on getting your money back tell them what they just did and bring it back to me and i will fix the cost problem and it will cost a lot to remove moisture out of a system that has been mo uh, moisture saturated um that's something I always did. Every time I did a conversion or a complete job, I always put a moisture indicator on a sight glass in the system and put it down in writing and with instructions to a customer. If you ever go to one of those quickie garage who do a recovery and recharge and you see your moisture indicator turn from green to yellow, get your money back. You'll, you'll win and go to the Bureau of Automotive Repair here in California. Uh, if you need to take a job because I'm going to charge a buttload of money to decontaminate the system to get all the moisture out to turn it back to green again and uh, the shop who did the job and has me come in after them is not going to like me <laughs> but I always stick moisture indicator lights in all my work when I do a complete system or if I do any modifications, or if it was in any of my original old restalls, 
my dad used to do the same things and we used to make up our own copper lines the old lines on really old systems were made out of copper and we used to form our own copper lines silver saws braze the ends and uh, make our own copper gaskets because these really old systems did not have compression fittings at the end or, or o-ring systems at the end the original old ones they were uh, like 27 degree or 47 degree angle fittings and they had copper gaskets and a lot of the new guys would take these systems apart and leave that copper gasket out there it would seal sometimes for a while and then leak later on they did not know that there was actually copper gaskets that was a big problem so i'm gonna do this old one one thing every now and then especially since this is an old system i just installed applied some nylog there's a nylog blue there's a nylog red but i just applied the nylog every so often you want to apply nylog on the inside you can see it's nice and shiny inside there oops where am i at? it's nice and shiny and it has a nice coating of nylog on the o-ring in there i could not get down there and put it on the fitting without making a mess all over so i applied the nylog in here on my o-rings you want to keep these o-rings well lubricated because you don't want them to get nicks and scuffs in the o-ring itself so i'll install this and we'll come back to another video i'll test my gauges make sure my gauges themselves without being hooked up to the system i could go well below 100 microns so i know my gauge set is still inside for you who watched my old videos you know every now and then i go over this but i haven't mentioned it in a long time uh, somebody just had this question on a forum last night we had a live meeting online and uh, somebody who's new to ask is it better to use the micron gauge inside a set of fields piece 480 uh, no yeah for this is the 480v use the micron gauge here or use a blue vac the answer will always be the best way is not to use gauges which i haven't really showed you guys yet i think i only did one or two videos showing that i don't go over that because it confuses people uh, so i use gauges for the the ones i do do videos on because it's less confusing and you can see numbers and people like to see numbers so it's best to not use gauges and use a direct hose line and if you could get a uh, blue vac micron gauge hooked up it's easier on old systems that had uh, pressure switches that had uh, valves inside of them that didn't leak and you hook up your blue vac if you could do that or on an adapter on the end of your brass adapter so you had fewer points to leak so every time you have a hose connection every time you have a service valve every time you have a sight glass or you have pre you always have all these points to leak your hoses themselves soak up moisture in them they get contaminated with oil the oil is extremely high hydroscopic and you will actually lose some of your micron reading you'll actually be reading moisture boiling out of your hoses a little refrigerant that has had absorbed into the moist uh, into the material of the hose slowly leaking out so you'll lose some of your indication by reading here if you could read directly inside the system with a gauge hooked up to it that would be your best measurement with just one line from your vacuum pump going to the system so i'm stressing that gauges aren't the best way to go but if you have no micron meter and you have the choice of, and this is answering the question to the guy who was on, we had the live online YouTube form where we were questioning and answering in. And I answered his question on a different form that someone was hosting. When he asked that question, I said, not using gauges is the best way to go. But if money was an issue and you have say, let's go over here. give you an example this true blue this is 300 and some dollars so if you had limited income and you wanted to make your choice between buying one of these or buying one of these and I was a beginner and I had to start I would tell somebody who is new to the system if he's going from analog gauges and I would say, spend the money and buy the field piece 480V 
and get this later, learn later. Uh, the reason for that is because the software that comes with this is incredible and the wireless Bluetooth tubes are remarkable with the software. You, it's a learning experience for you to learn a little bit about subcooling, superheat, and you could use the temperature probes and you can move them around when you have access. You can actually read the temperature of refrigerant going into a condenser and you, then you could read the temperature of refrigerant coming out of a condenser and you could look for blockages that way or airflow issues. This is such a great learning tool if you're willing to read. And then you could hook it up to your laptop. You could look at, hook it up to your um, Apple or your Android and they're scanning and, and data uh, recording information and you actually could read the microns going down and you could read the pressures and temperatures. This is an excellent learning tool. So I'll get back to this and take a video when I'm on the vacuum. And I'll probably make a video showing you me testing just the gauges. And then maybe I'll make another video after I charge the system. See you on video number two and then video possibly number three.